Hey everybody, how's it going? What's Juan up? and Aaron here with Hilco Homes and uh, Ask Wholesale. And today we're going to actually be analyzing a real deal for you guys. Uh, we're going to go through it and we're going to walk you through it. And we're going to make sure that you guys understand all the different kinds of problems that we came across. And at the end, we're going to provide some solutions. So make sure to stay tuned. Stay tuned, guys. Hey guys, how's it going? Juan okay. Busos here and uh, Aaron Perez. And this is Ask Wholesale. Here we are, episode 16. 16. We're already on episode 16, guys. It's, this is pretty crazy. This is growing into something that do uh, it with my hand I, don't, anymore. I don't even have that many fingers. <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to bring up my toes now. But let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's stink. not do that. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, just, let's just leave our feet off the table, guys. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of exciting questions here for you today uh, that were asked. Uh, the first question, and we're going to jump right into it, is actually um, what happens when you come across a problem that could potentially kill a deal? Right. So uh, I know Aaron's had a few, more than a few of those. So uh, let's have him start. Yeah, guys. So uh, what I was saying was that when you come across a, come across a problem that could potentially kill a deal, um, I've come to realize that they're not deal killers. They're more like roadblocks. And... By roadblocks, I mean, for example, we had a, I got two examples real quick, but one of them was basically, um, we, we basically got a deal from a, from a, from another wholesaler. And I've said it before, uh, getting a deal from another wholesaler is actually a form of lead generation. You know, I, I try to work with other wholesalers because I know at the end of the day, another wholesaler may actually bring me a buyer. In this particular case, I was trying to bring him a buyer. So he sent me the deal. I sent it to my buyer. And my buyer did his due diligence on it. Come to find out that this property was actually in a flood zone. Um, I didn't know that. The original wholesaler didn't know that either. And so I didn't even know how to look up if it was in a flood zone. Found out how to look it up. Uh, you go to, you know, uh, one way is here in San Antonio is uh, SanAntonioRiver.gov. Uh, or you can just Google San Antonio flood zones and it'll actually pop up the map. You put in the address, it'll pop up the map and it'll show you where the border lines are for flood zones and if if the property is in the flood zone it'll be highlighted in blue and basically what a flood zone does is the insurance on a flood zone is like an extra hundred dollars a month so you're looking at another like twelve hundred dollars a year so on a cash flow property that could potentially kill the deal because it could potentially kill the cash flow um but anyways i told my buyer okay well what do you need what do you need to be at and he he, he worked it to where he included the flood zone insurance and all that and he told me i need to be at this price I said, okay. So then I told the wholesaler, hey, man, you know it's in a flood zone, right? And he's like, no, I didn't know that. And so I told him, and I'm like, so here's what I need the price at in order for it to work. And the thing is, he hadn't sold it yet. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, fortunately, our buyer could actually pay a little bit higher price for this property. Um, Despite for the fact that he had to come down. Right. Because of the fact that it was in a flood right. zone. Right. So, but he hadn't sold it yet. Um, the numbers just weren't there. And then the flood zone made it even worse. So I said, hey, man, look, we can do this deal. We can we can drop the earnest money right now, but I need it at this price. And so he went to go talk to his guys and whatnot. And so instead of just killing the deal or him saying, nah, I don't want to do it. We're just going to let it go. He made it work to where he gave me a price that I needed it, needed it at so that I can give it to my buyer at the price he needed it at. And basically, we turned a, a deal that could have potentially, I mean, flood zone. That I mean, who wants to pick up a property in a flood zone? You know what I mean? But... The fact is, we were able to negotiate the price. I, I I asked the buyer what he needed, so I took that price and then I renegotiated with the wholesaler, and we ended up making a deal happen. That's just one example. Another example, same scenario. I don't know, you want me to? No, I was gonna say, guys, that's a that's a perfect example of uh, coming across a roadblock. A lot of people see. That's why we get paid the big bucks. I say it all the time. That's why we get paid the thousands of dollars and all that Benjamins. stuff. Benjamins is because no. the Benjamins, right? Who's who's, a, who's so, on the thousand dollar bill? I don't know. Me. Maybe it's, it's probably me. No. no. So, guys, that's why we get paid the big bucks. Why do we get paid the big bucks? Because we're problem solvers. We coordinate everything. We direct everything. We're like movie directors, right? We have to make sure that the deal... Uh, we make the deal work, all right? The deal... It's seldom that a deal comes along and it's just like, oh, poof, it's already working. It's great, right? 
you have to make the deal work and you might pick it up and not realize that it's in a flood zone right which is why you always want to do uh as much research on it as possible um but not only that but you know it, you get creative with problem solving. You can't just, oh, oh, it's in a flood zone. Nobody likes flood zones. Let me go home and find another deal. No, this is a situation where, okay, you ask your buyer, what do I have to do to get it to work, right? Well, how do I how do I make this work for you, Mr. Buyer? Well, you know, you can make it work for me if you, uh, maybe it's not a price drop. Maybe, yeah, I'd be willing to pay that, but it would have to be owner financed, Right. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe I'm not. Maybe uh, maybe I am willing to pay that. Maybe I'm not willing to pay that. I need to lower the price point. Whatever it may be, right? Or uh, shoot, it could be something as as easy as hey, get me some insurance quotes for some flood zones right. for flood zones, right? I mean that 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 might work also. So you you really want to? There's no there's really no such thing as a deal killer. Like there's a few deals where you know maybe it's just hard to sell or maybe it's not the right time for that property and nobody really wants it or it's the 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 fact of the matter is real estate the only reason real estate doesn't move is because it's priced too high for its area so there's really no such thing as a deal killer that would have been a deal killer but aaron was smart enough to come uh up with a solution on how to make that happen you're gonna yeah so another example is the same thing got a got another deal same thing from another wholesaler um pitched it to my buyer and the buyer went to go look at it the numbers were there the numbers worked and everything but when the buyer went to go walk the property the neighbor of that property was telling them stuff saying hey i don't know if y'all know this but whoever picks up this house whoever owns this house i'm gonna sue them because of the fence line what it was is when this neighbor went on vacation the previous landlord put up a fence and supposedly it was in the neighbor's property line so a survey had to get ordered we ordered the survey uh survey came back and it showed that yeah the fence was actually like three or four feet into the neighbor's property um and at the time the wholesaler uh they didn't they didn't know that either and the thing is we had already dropped the earnest money so it came out that the buyer didn't want to deal with it because of the neighbor and so we actually renegotiated. We renegotiated the price. I said, okay, well, what, what, what do you need it at? And the same thing. I told the buyer, well, what do you need it at? And he's like, if you can do it at this price. Uh, or actually, he said, I, give me a quote on, uh, on, on, on the fence. So actually, I caught some fence companies or whatever. They said that in order to move it, you, you can't just move it over. You actually have to take out the, they're called uh, horse ties or horse something. You actually have to take those out and move the fence over. And the quote on that was like sixty five hundred seven thousand. So I told the wholesaler, "Look, man, we need to move this fence because if not, there's gonna be problems down the line. The survey's not even right." I was like, "Can you come down on price? You know, six seven thousand." And they weren't able to come down six or seven thousand, but they were able to come down on the seller. I don't know a couple grand. Then they came down a couple grand on their fee. We came down a couple grand on our fee, and so that the buyer could get the price that he wanted it at. And so at the end of the day, we made the numbers work. You know, we worked all together to make the to make the numbers work versus, you know, it's a versus just killing the deal because the neighbor was gonna sue whoever picked it up just because the part the the fence was on the property line. So we made it. We again we found the problem and then we figured out how can we come up with a solution to make it work. And at the end of the day, everybody made money, so it was it was still worth it. Yeah, guys, there's like a like I mentioned earlier, there's really no situation where there's a deal killer. I remember I had one. Um, last year and this is this is actually uh this is actually an example of one of the roadblocks that we came across in the deal that we're going to analyze today um so what had happened was there was the the property was in in the historic district i had never ever wholesaled a property in the historic district and come to find out that if you buy a property in the historic district and you're planning to rehab it you need to get approval from the historic committee i didn't know this i just okay it's in the historic district it's worth more i i didn't i didn't know this right so even even me i'm learning new things all the time right mm -hmm. um so what we did was well, we found out okay the historic committee is going to have to uh give an approval uh of the guy's rehab well the first time around the buyer's rehab wasn't approved he had to rehash the rehab and make it, it was something about the windows they didn't want him to replace the windows they he could only re, uh, fix them instead of replacing them it was in the woodlawn lake historic district here in san antonio and 
um, it was gonna take it, it took they were gonna take a whole month to approve it. And then when that when that whole month came along, he had to submit another rehab, and it was gonna take a whole another month. And I said, "No way, man! This is this deal's already dragging on too long." So instead of instead of just like, "Oh, well, let me just wait another month," and potentially losing the deal with my seller, who, thank God, he was extremely patient with us and what the situation was, um, he, you know, instead of potentially losing that, what I did was I hopped on the phone and I said, "You know what? I'm gonna take the reins on this." I called the historic committee and I said, "Hey, I, I'm on the transaction on this deal. I'm helping out. Uh, I'm helping the the deal move along, and I need to know what it is we're pending in order to get approved, or what it is that we have to do, or how do we go ahead." I not even joking. I, they said, "Oh, the lady who uh, deals with that is uh, out for the day. She'll be back tomorrow." The next day, she called me back. We had a phone call. She approved it right then and there. Sent the email. We ended up uh, we ended up getting the historic committee to approve it right then and there instead of waiting a whole two months that could have potentially ended up losing the uh, losing the the patience of the seller. So you want to sometimes you have to jump in there and take the reins yourself. Sometimes I mean sometimes you have to treat it like this is my investment because it kind of is. I mean if you think about it, you're investing. You've already invested all this time. You're not gonna let either somebody who's you know moving too slow uh get in the way of you and your paycheck you're not gonna let some you're not gonna let something like an approval from the historic committee taking too long i mean i literally made a 10 minute phone call no the first phone call was like five minutes the second phone call was 10 minutes so i spent 15 minutes 15 minutes on the phone to get it approved whereas otherwise we would have to have waited a whole nother month maybe month and a half to even get that approved and then that's just getting it approved sending it to the buyer's lender sending the approval to the buyer's uh hard money lender and having them approve it and then review it that would have taken another week or two mm -hmm. right instead of taking two months for all that process we ended up taking a couple days so sometimes you need to take the reins on these roadblocks and just jump in there and say, hey, I'm on this transaction. I'm the one who's handling this. I'm the one who's procuring this. I'm the one who's making sure. I'm the one who's directing this movie, and I want this mm -hmm. to go like this. What do we have to do to get that done? Yeah, It's really not that hard, guys. Just call whoever you have to call. Do whatever you have to do. If you have to get rehab bids, if you have to get fence bids, if you have to get surveys, if you have to get this and that, if you have to get things that are going to cost you money, you're going to have to tell your, you know, maybe tell your buyer, hey, man, this is going to cost us money. We're going to need to put in on it. Or tell your seller, hey, you did something that you weren't supposed to, like build a fence on somebody else's property line, and now we're going to have to pay for it. I need you to come down on price because of your mistake. Right. You know what I mean? So, so there's really no actual deal killers. Yeah, um, it's just about, at the end of the day, you just got to always think, what can I do to make this work? What can I do to make this work? What can I do to make this work? Because there's always a way. You just got to figure it out. Yeah, definitely. Even if it takes a little bit longer than, than usual. Or maybe if you just figure it out, it will take a lot less time than you think. Right. Um, but yeah, that I, I want to use that to... to I want to kind of segue, use that to segue into our next segment of uh, Ask Wholesale. Here it comes. First time we're doing it. Drum roll, please. And it's actually the deal analyzation segment. Um, what we're going to do in this segment, uh, what we're basically doing in this segment is we're going to take deals, right, that either uh, you send us or ones that we, we're working ourselves. We'd prefer for you guys to send us your deals or send us questions about your deals so we can analyze it. It doesn't just have to be numbers. It, you know, it can be number specific. It can be uh, like, hey, I came across this roadblock, mm -hmm. right? And uh, this is, you know, how do I handle this situation? Hey, my seller's telling me this. My buyer's telling me that. What do I do? And we'll actually, if you send them to us, we'll answer you real time via email or text message or however it is that you're communicating with us. And um, we'll also answer it on a future episode of Ask Wholesale. So make sure to send us your deals and your deal analyzations. So that way we can help you guys out and we can help anybody else out there who might be coming across the same problem as you. Um, that being said, the deal we're going to analyze today... There's a property, and I call it my nightmare property. <laughs> I think, you know, I feel like, you know, Aaron's been through a few, but this one this one dragged on for a good solid four months, man. <laughs> um, and I guess I, guess I can say, the, I, I, I guess I won't give the actual address, but it was on Woodlawn, right, in the historic district, as I was saying earlier. And the numbers were easy, like that. I think the ARV was close to 200000 I think it was 200000 uh the uh rehab was like 50 to 55 seller comes up to me and says hey i want 80 right i was like 
yeah, okay, let's do it, right? You're Super like, nah, easy 79.5. I was like, nah, 79.5. <laughs> no, actually, he came in and he wanted I, I, he wanted 90, but he was really open to negotiation. He was a little bit older. He didn't he didn't really want to deal with it anymore. And he's just up there right. in age. And he lived four hours away. To, so to drive four hours to come and maintain the property so that way he doesn't get fined, is just it was just too much for him. So he was like, whatever, take it. I inherited it anyway. It's not a big deal. So... uh. So we come to a negotiation and told him I can knock it out at 80. He said, that's fine. That sounds good. We sign the contract. We get everything ready. We open up title. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be easy, squeezy, lemon, peasy, right? <laughs> Not even, man. Easy, squeezy. <laughs> easy, squeezy, lemon, peasy. So we we contract it. And I'm looking for a buyer. And I, I've got a lot of interest on it. And like three, I think you came with me. Like three or four days after we blasted it, we went to the house of a, of a gentleman who uh was a contractor slash he'd been buying properties and building new homes for certain companies uh here in san antonio since the 80s since the early 80s and before i was born or like late 70s yeah. before i was born so i was like okay cool looked him up i found out that he did own a few properties that his loc did own a few properties and he he was a legit buyer and he was a legit investor okay cool so what ha- he, we were at the we we're at the table we we're at his kitchen table we we're negotiating and I you know at first it sounded like I kind of did good but the real the reality of it is I did poorly on my negotiation. Um, we ended up moving the contract from our title company to the title company of his choice. We came down twenty five hundred dollars in price, and we put the close date not for two weeks but for the original the close date of the original contract that we had. Which I was like, okay, cool. We only came down a little bit on price and we're still going to close. Great. So come, I think the original, I think we contracted in, we assigned the contract, we contracted like at the end of July and the close date was for September. I think it was like August and like, yeah, close date in September. Yeah. the Yeah. Something like that. So, uh, so September, so September comes along and my birthday's in September, so I'm thinking nice, nice good payday, right? Right before my birthday. Well, two days before we're supposed to close, it was a Wednesday, we're supposed to close that Friday. No, scratch that. We're supposed to close at the end of August. It was a Wednesday, we're supposed to close Friday, right? And he calls us up and says, hey, I don't even have a lender in place. Like, I need to find a lender so we're not ready to close. What do you mean you don't have a lender? That should have been something you took care of like weeks ago. <laughs> You're like, and, and not only that, but the person who referred that buyer to us was a lender. So we're like, we thought we were going to get funding with this guy. Right. He's like, no, I didn't like his number. So I'm gonna, I, I decided to go with somebody else, but I haven't found anybody else. So, okay, cool. Not a big deal. Let's help you find a lender. We're going to work with you. Let's help you find a lender. And not only that, but I went back and I negotiated an extension with the seller. I got a two-week extension. Two weeks later, this is the time that it's around my birthday time, right? And I'm sitting here thinking, all right, great. Here comes a good payday. We're getting ready to close. All of a sudden, this guy calls up and says, hey, uh, you know, I've been sick. I'm not going to be able to close, right? And it's like, what do you mean you're not going to be able to close? You you, Sign a paper. If you're in the hospital, we'll send a mobile notary, right? Right. No. He, we end up getting another extension, and in the middle of that extension, we got a month extension. Thank God the seller's been cooperative, and I've built enough rapport with him. I was going to say, that's good. Always build rapport with your sellers in case a situation like this happens. Exactly. So you want to build rapport. You want to try and build rapport on both sides, and that's what I was doing. I was building rapport. With, I had built rapport with the seller. I was trying to build rapport with a buyer who could potentially buy it, who had the, enough buying power to buy more properties. So, okay, so he got sick. So, and then at the end of that, uh, we got another month extension. And then at the end of that extension, come to find out the property's in a historic district, right? <laughs> the property's in a historic district. I knew this, but I had never sold a property in the historic district. Come to find out, like I said a little bit earlier, we had to get an approval from the historic committee. They took a whole month to get back to them, right? And until I hopped on the phone and I said, hey, we need to get this done. What can we do? Boom. They said, we got it. We're done. We're ready to go. Okay, cool. The middle of August, September, the middle of October, come to find out we're getting ready to close. We got the approval. We got the hard money lender in place. Everything's ready to go. Seller's like, oh, um, my wife is sick. 
and I can't close. She's in the hospital, and and she's got she's got the West Nile virus. And I'm like, what? How do you even get that? <laughs> like, I don't even know what that is, to be honest with you. I know it was popular back then. When I say popular, it was a big deal back then. But now it's kind of like, but when, you don't hear about it anymore. What was it? West Nile mosquitoes. Oh. It was something with mosquitoes. But yeah, apparently she had the West Nile virus and he couldn't close. And I said, and she, apparently, we didn't know about this. She was a signer on his LLC, so she had to sign. Now, granted, this entire time we're trying to get updates from the title company. Hey, do we, uh, do we, what do we do? What do we do? And I guess this title company wasn't very cooperative. I'm not really sure what they were doing. Um, but they, they wouldn't give us updates. They'd give our seller updates. They'd give the buyer no, the, updates. The title company wasn't cooperative because... I think also the buyer wanted to use his title company. Yeah, the buyer wanted to use his title company. I think he did that for a reason. The title company wasn't being very cooperative. We asked for updates on the daily multiple times. And the only reason I was getting the updates is because my seller, again, built good rapport, was calling me and saying, hey, this is where we're at. So I was CCing him. I was CCing my seller on every update that I was trying to get with the uh, title company. Uh, another problem that we had in that that I hadn't mentioned was that our buyer went and tried to undercut us by talking to our seller and trying to make us seem like the bad guys because we're going to make $20,000 on this deal, 20 plus thousand dollars. It was a $22,000 fee. Trying to make us seem like the bad guy. And the seller, being the kind gentleman that he was, is just like, I don't care. I sold it to him for a price. Whatever he makes on it is what he makes on it. That's his business. And so the buyer ended up trying to make us look bad. And then he sent some, he ended up sending some nasty email about, because I showed up in my Superman shirt to negotiation, like, okay, it's the middle of July. I'm not going to show up in a hot, sweaty suit. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. I think he's jealous. I think, yeah, I think he was mad because I'm Superman and, you know, you know how it goes. <laughs> so, anyways, so we end up, uh, he's trying to undercut us all at the same time. And the seller's being nice enough to give me updates. So, finally, I said, I said, no more. If you don't close by this date, man, I've been trying to work with you for the past three and a half months, four months about this. If you don't close by this date, we're just going to keep your your earnest money, your deposit. Well, we call the title company to, to let them know that we might be doing that. They're like, oh, well, you can't do that, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Title company was being super uncooperative. So what we did was we got in contact with the lender. They had everything in place. End of the day, we end up situating it to where we close. We finally close. And we get the deal done. We all get paid out. And even though it was a good payday, it was such a long process and so many roadblocks in that one deal that it's just like it just it taught me some lessons. The lessons are one of the lessons. The one. Well, let's go over the roadblocks first. The first roadblock was he didn't have a lender mm -hmm. right in place, so we helped him find a lender. He didn't have a lender in place on time, so we helped him find a lender. After we helped him find a lender. He got sick, right? So now, I mean, I didn't send him medicine or anything, right? But <laughs> I mean, now we're in a situation wait. where it's like kind of hurry up and wait for him to get better, right? Calling right. up and checking up on him and checking up on his health and whatnot while simultaneously uh, keeping rapport with the seller. The next situation was a historic committee. That was something that he should have handled. That was something that the buyer should have been handling and it was taking him way too long. It was going to take him... A month and a half longer to get it done so in that situation again i took the reins and i said hey i'm gonna handle this i called the historic committee i found out what number to call i found out who i had to contact and i told them hey we need to put a rush on this can we get it done and she's like yeah let's do it right now it's approved don't worry about it you're good cool the next situation was that his wife had the west nile virus now there's nothing i can do about that but that's when i started putting pressure on him i said hey if you don't do this we're going to keep your deposit. It's been a few months. We've been trying to work with you. We've been trying to get everything done. Not only have you been really disrespectful and nasty with us, but you know, you've been disrespectful and nasty with the title company and with the seller, and you just haven't been a good uh, player in this situation. So if you don't get this done, we're going to end up keeping your deposit. We know we have the right to. Um, so we ended up put, kind of leaning on him uh, about it, and he, now he, and then we ended up getting the deal closed. So those are some of the roadblocks we came along those are some of the things that, um, those are some of the things that, uh, that I, those are some of the ways that I was able to, uh, come over those roadblocks. Some of the lessons that I learned guys are some key ones is stick to your guns, mm -hmm. right? Stick to your guns, especially when it comes to a new buyer, 
buyers are your clients and you always want to make sure that they're taken care of and comfortable but at the very beginning unless they bought four five six seven eight nine properties from you you need to stick to your guns hey this is the way i operate what i shouldn't have done was change the title company because we have if we had left it at our title company uh which is i'm gonna shoot out a name alamo title dd jackson you guys are great we love you all right just shout like, out just letting y'all know shout out you guys are amazing we love the work that you guys do for us uh, if we had kept it at our title company we would have been able to pull that deposit without any kind of problems because they know what we do yeah. and they know that we would have been in our own right and they would have been they would have been cooperative with that um we would have gotten full if we had kept it at our title company we would have gotten full updates um if we had uh not gotten that extended closing date we would have been done like that. That that was a deal. That property was a deal at ten grand more than what we were asking. So we could have easily pulled the contract, pulled the deposit, and um, reblasted it. And reblasted it, and then and then gotten another buyer. So guys, uh, if a buyer's being difficult, sometimes things happen, and you want to work with them, great. But if they're being difficult, ugly, disrespectful, and nasty to you, that's not somebody you want to work with anyway. That's not somebody you want as your client anyway. I know I always say buyers are your clients, but also, if they're get, being really ugly people, you don't you don't want to lose money. You don't want to lose time because they want they want to be uh, treated almost entitled. Mm -hmm. So you want to so you want to make sure that you stick to your guns, especially when it's a new buyer, um, and and you want to make sure that you you uh, you don't give in on a lot of those negotiations. Uh, that's a big lesson that I learned is that, and sometimes you need to put your foot down and and. Maybe not always be the nice guy. Sometimes you just got to say, hey, man, I've been giving you enough chances. I'm going to keep your money. I mean, you already knew what it was and you knew what this, you know how this business works. It is what it is. Don't do it right off the bat. If they're supposed to close Friday and they can't close till Monday, then you keep their $2,000. Don't be that guy, right? But if they're dragging <laughs> it out for three months, then yeah, maybe you got a little bit of a right to say, hey, I'm going to keep your deposit or hey, I'm going to keep half of your deposit. And I'll refund you half of it. You know, something like that. So those are some lessons that I learned the long, hard way over the span of four, four and a half months uh, of doing of doing this deal. Yeah, you learn as you go. I mean, even myself, like Juan was saying earlier, I mean, I've come across so much bad luck, so much roadblocks. I don't even know, like, it's like I'm cursed or something, to be honest. But uh, but yeah, it, it just preps you for the next for the next. Uh, Hugo Holmes and the Cursed Child. <laughs> yeah, I know, like that Harry Potter book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it just it preps you for when that situation comes up comes up again. You're like, oh, I know how to handle this, and then you just you handle it because you've been through it and you know exactly what to do. Yeah, and even if you haven't been through it, guys, when it comes to these roadblocks and these deal analyzations, even if you haven't been through it, sometimes you've been hit so many times on. Like all these roadblocks, you're just like, whatever, let's just see how right. we can get this done. Yeah, exactly. No big deal. You you already start thinking about how you can solve problems. You start getting into that mentality of problem solving. So, um, you know, you definitely, uh, and if you need help, like I said, reach out to us. Ask us your questions. Send us your deals. We'll help you analyze them uh, in real time. And then we'll answer those uh, deal analyzations here uh, on Ask Wholesale. Speaking uh, of a historic district... Uh, we're probably going to get into our fun question. What is our favorite 80s movie? Wow, yeah, that is historic. Yeah, so... Um, I was born in the 80s, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, we were born in the late 80s, though. What are you, like two days yeah, older than me? You're like two days older than me. Two we're days born older in 88. Um, so, but, I mean, we didn't see a lot of the 80s, right? But we were around just in time to catch the aftermath of it. Right. So, so, for, so, go ahead. Oh, no, no, for, go ahead. Go ahead. For mines, and I still like to watch it is because uh, I think it'd be pretty cool to do it, and not is is weird science, <laughs> and I and I don't mean pretty cool to make like a Barbie doll real. <laughs> yeah, I, I I mean like uh I mean because in the movie they made a spaceship, you know, from a magazine turn real. So for me, I'd be like, I would want like a badass like Ferrari or something to where I can turn that and make it real and I could drive that. Three D printing, man. 3D printing. 3D printing. It's a thing now. 3D print. Oh, I mean, yeah, it they, is. It yeah, is. 3D printing. It's a thing now. But it'd yeah. be cool if it was more accessible. Now, I will tell you, I saw one one time walk up with a, a bra on his head. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. I had just, it was a long night. We were partying. It was nah, a dare. Somebody paid me 50 bucks. No, I'm just kidding. That's a good movie. What's your, what's your favorite thing about that movie? My favorite thing? Honestly, I just like the how they were like. They ended up just being like the cool dudes at the end, you know what I mean? Everybody ended up liking them, but that's because 
Is that why you try so hard to be a cool dude? <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> why. I'm just kidding. But I'm already cool, so. Yeah. There you go. Because you try hard. No, I'm just kidding. What's yours, dude? It's, that's actually a really good movie, and I remember seeing that movie growing up. They, uh, they also used to have a TV show. Did it? Yeah, it was a TV show called Re- Weird Science. It was based off the movie, and it was really... Um, that I didn't know. It was pretty good. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't have the same character. It didn't have the same guys, but it was the same concept. Uh, mean older brother, two nerds, created genie or whatever, she, whatever she is who helped. Like yeah, you I know, forgot what her she's name is. Magical. I forgot what her name was. She was really hot though. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, my favorite '80s movie is actually uh, it's actually hard to tell you because there's a lot of good ones out there. But I want to say I want to say one of my favorite ones is Young Guns and Young Guns Two. I think Young Guns Two came out in the early '90s, but Young Guns. Uh, with Emilio Estevez as Billy the Kid, that was a great movie. I've never man. seen that one. You've never seen it? Oh, man. Nah. <laughs> it, it is such a good movie. So it tells the story of Billy the Kid. I mean, kind of tells the story of Billy the Kid. It's kinda, it's uh, this old man who claims to be that he claims to be Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid was never shot and killed, and he's telling the story of how uh, things went down back then. Um, it's just full of action it's full of i mean it's got I've some heard comedy of, i've heard of billy the kid but i didn't know where that movie came from or what yeah well young guns is based on billy the kid and actually bon jovi wrote a song called uh, blaze of glory uh i'm going down that song in a blaze of glory yes no okay, okay. well yeah. he wrote that he sings song. it better but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no yeah he sings it way better i'm sorry guys i'm a shower singer i sing in the shower <laughs> i sing karaoke when i'm drunk and it's just it's i'm not very good at it i'm sorry guys I was almost embarrassed to sing that part, but anyways, he wrote that song for that movie, and it's based on it's based on the life and actions of Billy the Kid. Um, but yeah, Billy the Kid probably one of the best, uh, one of my favorite. I, I'm I'm into westerns, you know. I also like movies like Tombstone. Tombstone's one of my favorite. Was that one made in the '80s? That one was also made in the no. '80s, wasn't it? I've seen Tombstone. Tombstone. If it was made in the '80s, then I gotta switch them out. I don't remember what year it was made, but Tombstone. Dude, I love I love westerns. So Tombstone and Young Guns are my two favorites of all time. I love those movies. I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good movie. Um, but that wraps it up for today, guys. That's your episode of Ask Wholesale. Make sure to send us your questions, your comments. If you guys have any questions, make sure to share this episode. Um, and and send us your like I like I've been saying. Send us your deals. Send us uh, questions that you have about your deals. We want to be we want to get more deal specific. Uh, so we want to, I mean, you know, maybe next time we'll do it in front of a board and we can write down the numbers for you and we can tell you this is how we calculate this or this is how we calculate our ARV or whatever. Most of you guys already know how to do that. Um, but if it's like a roadblock that you came across or you don't know how to handle a certain situation or if a seller told you this or that, and you're really not sure how to do that, we're really good at dealing with, we're really, it's like we always say, real estate isn't a house business, it's a people business. Right. So uh, we'll help you handle those situations. Other than that, man, you guys have a good day, and uh, go Thanks, and get guys. your money. We'll Appreciate see you all next y'all watching. Time. Thank y'all. Neglecting your negotiation skills is one of the biggest atrocities in the wholesale world. If you do not work on specifically improving your negotiation skill set, someone with less resources with better negotiation skills, they're gonna come to a swoop up your lunch. Because you know how the old saying goes, you never get what you deserve in life, you only get what you negotiate out of it. once said, a man who knows everything truly knows he knows nothing at all. So I want you guys to always be looking for ways to learn, ways to improve, and you'll never have to worry about making another check because you always got skills that you're constantly improving that will help you always pay those bills.